of the most difficult part of the syllabus not easy to explain and very difficult to comprehend also you need to imagine all the forces inside the engine that are taking place and the forces that we are concerned with are the forces arising not out of combustion it is the inertia forces that are developing within the engine because the piston assembly the connecting rod the crosshair the bottom end they all have very heavy masses and these heavy masses when they move they create a lot of force by themselves without the engine firing of course the engine will not move if it is not firing but when they fires and moves it is not only gas pressures and forces which are causing the torque or rotation it is also the inertia forces that cause enormous amount of stresses displacements movements within the ship within the engine so that is why i have been trying to explain to you where these forces act within the engine when only the masses are concerned <coughs> if you were to consider the bed plate made of rubber just imagine that the bed plate is made of rubber what would happen now i have particularly told you that we are considering only the horizontal forces the horizontal forces at the crank shaft axis and the horizontal forces at the cross head axis so these are the two planes where the forces act of course there is one more force which has to be taken into consideration when the piston is moving up all right there is some amount of inertia force that is involved in dragging the piston up and along with it the entire bearing is being pulled upwards similarly when it is coming down the inertia forces is immediately pressing down in the downward direction and ultimately it is received by the main bearings so the main bearings which are <coughs> taking the load are not only taking the gas pressure loads they are also taking the inertia loads of the components which are rotating in the engine so apart from gas pressure load there are loads arising from inertia inertia is on account of the masses that are moving within the engine jatin bhaskar has left the meeting <coughs> never mind he'll come back i am also having internet connectivity problem sometimes it goes off so you all stay there do not go away we'll finish this class by 11 what is it 11 11 o'clock about 11:10 so we have 60 boys right now 60 students right now so let us get started and i think we were on page 12 we what was the page we were on somebody kartik do you remember it was 16 where, where were we last we were to start from 16 16 16 okay we are on 16 here you are vibrations in ships and engines this is also a part where we have to imagine a lot of things because i can't show you the force that is causing a vibration all right so the force that is causing a vibration is something you have to imagine so let's go through it vibrations in ships and engines this is an important chapter also this is common in ships and is undesirable yes it is and you as engineers on board the ship you are expected to reduce vibration of all machinery components to the best you can because ultimately vibration you will see in our study that vibration is the cause of fatigue failure everybody knows what is fatigue failure so vibration is the chief cause of such failure somebody has come to tell sir out okay vibration this this is common in ships and is undesirable but it is not it is inevitable it is not avoidable it is there only thing is you have to reduce it to the minimum the two most noticeable effects of such vibration is structural fatigue and discomfort to crew and passengers discomfort is there because continuously you are on the ship and if the vibrations are heavy you see it will reach your cabin also when you sleep in your cabin 
you will get a rumble, continuous sub subsided rumble when you are sleeping. It is not totally silent and pin drop silence. In fact, when you come off from the ship, you will find it is very uncomfortable because you are not used to such silence and such, you know, absolute pin drop silence. Because on the ship, the generators are continuously running. Main engines may not be running all the time because in the harbor, in the port, the engines are off. But your generators will be running and those generators can cause some amount of vibration which can be felt in your cabin also. In fact, this vibration is an advantage to you. When the vibration is on, you feel less. The generators are running in complete comfort. Moment there is absolute pin drop silence on the ship, then you have reason to worry. That means the engines have shut down and something is wrong because the rumble has to be there all the time. Structural fatigue. What is structural fatigue? That means any component in the engine or on the hull of the ship, in the superstructure, any part of the ship which is under continuous vibration is subject to potential failure. Remember this. Anything vibrates is subject to potential failure. Vibration is ships, in ships is categorized into two types. One is machinery vibration, one is hull vibration. The hull vibration is generally generated from the propeller. When the propeller starts vibrating, it transmits the vibration into the hull of the ship, that is the off part of the ship. But definitely you can find it even at the four peak, the hull vibration. If you put your ear to any structural part of the engine, you will get the sound of the engine and the propeller very clearly. Because sound travels through solid medium much better than a rarer medium like in the air. So the two sources of vibration are machinery vibration and hull vibration. Hull by itself cannot vibrate. There has to be a forcing frequency. This forcing frequency has to come from the propeller. All machinery with parts moving at certain frequencies induce vibrations. That means any component that is moving, it will cause a vibration. Main engines, shafts, gearboxes, propellers, pumps, etc. all transmit vibration when they are working. Okay. <clears throat> vibration causes damages, definitely. This is one thing everybody we should be aware of. If the vibration level or amplitude in the engine increases more than normal, then what will happen? Then cracks in the attached piping. You see, the engine by itself is vibrating. So the pipes which are attached to it will also be transmitted with some amount of vibration. So that causes a lot of stress. And that stress is liable to cause damage to the piping. It is not only piping, it is not only piping that can get damaged. And remember, there are so many pipings, cooling water, starting air, lubricating oil, fuel oil, fresh water, sea water, starting air. There are so many pipes which are attached to the engine. And if the engine starts vibrating, then these attached pipes will start breaking. So there has to be some flexibility provided. Apart from the piping, you also have a turbocharger which is mounted on one part of the engine. Remember that part of the engine, it is not rigidly coupled to the engine. If it was rigidly coupled to the engine, then those bolts which are holding the turbocharger to the engine, they will break. They will break because it cannot support such a mass and be allowed to vibrate. So what they do, they have springs which are fitted between the frame on which the engine is and the frame which the turbocharger is. Between these two frames, you have springs. So the bolts go through the frame of plate to the spring and then they are bolted. So it is like a cushion for the turbocharger to be based with the engine. Raj Tamang. Okay. Oh, Mama Mia. They are still coming in. Ravi Prakash. Okay. So 
the turbocharger is mounted with some shock absorbers the shock absorbers are basically springs so the foundation of the turbocharger is sitting on springs and those springs are attached with the help of bolts with the plates onto the main engine so if there is a vibration of the engine it is not entirely transmitted to the turbocharger you see the turbocharger itself is a casing and inside the casing you have a rotor and this rotor has certain clearances at the bearing if the entire casing is made to vibrate then the rotor inside will start rattling even if it is few hundreds of a millimeter there will be impact loading on the bearings and it will damage the bearings so within certain limits that vibration can be acceptable but beyond a certain level those bearings are not going to have a very long life span they will get damaged very clearly and you know what happens if the bearings get damaged moment the bearing gets damaged there will be misalignment and moment there is misalignment then the dynamic forces which are generated are in all direction and i showed you all the couples that come about these couples become much more if there is a disbalance of the masses a rotor for a turbocharger has to be statically balanced as well as dynamically balanced so if these balances go haywire because of bearing damage there is guaranteed damage for the turbocharger okay next is fretting in the engine structure joints between a frame and entablature and also bed plate you see what is fretting fretting is you know impact forces very small impact forces between two surfaces when there is vibration if two components are bolted together and not tightened what will happen due to vibration one will vibrate against the other and then what happens then the surface gets damaged and powder starts coming out metal powder and this metal powder further ex ex this powder as it comes off it exposes nascent metal you know what is nascent metal fresh metal as shining that metal is exposed to the oxygen or atmosphere in the air and it starts oxidizing so then you have a layer of rust formation between so that rust again falls out it becomes an abrasive and it causes more amount of fretting so this fretting is a continuous erosion basically it is a form of erosion combined with some amount of oxidation so ultimately what happens the two surfaces become bigger and bigger and bigger and the components become very loose so the engine chocks and holding down bolts will also become loose the tie rod will also become loose so this fretting has to be stopped and it can be stopped only by correctly tensioning all nuts and bolts in the engine because the whole engine is going to vibrate and if you have loose nuts and bolts fretting is going to occur so i hope you understand what is fretting it is impact forces between two running surfaces to cause damage to both the surfaces and loosening of the components okay next is damage to the intermediate shaft its bearing and bearing support see the whole propeller shaft consists of the crankshaft intermediate shaft tail and shaft the intermediate shaft may be a long number of shaft pieces which are bolted together in the flange so the entire length between the engine and the tail end shaft is called the intermediate shaft so that shaft is sometimes held by means of plumber blocks plumber blocks are you know uh, bearings which are based on the tank top or on the structure of the engine at the floor plate level so these bearings are impacted upon by the shaft if there is vibration so they get damaged so the shaft will get damaged the bearing also will get damaged next is damage to thrust bearing how does thrust bearing get damaged okay this is on account of axial vibration of the intermediate shaft and tail end shaft actually that you see the propeller is mounted on the tail end shaft and when the propeller turns in the water there is no uniform thrust on the propeller there is some amount of pulsations why is this happening see the propeller blade 
the top blade is under a lower static head that means the water pressure on the upper blade is a little less as compared to the water pressure at the bottom blade so when the bottom blade comes on top and the top blade goes at the bottom there is a change in the forces arising out of pressure differences this continuous change in pressure differences causes a fluctuation in the resulting force on the propeller face if you see the propeller face ultimately while it's turning the force on the propeller face is not uniform there is some amount of pulsation this pulsation is transmitted to the shaft as axial vibration this axial vibration is ultimately checked at the thrust block the thrust block has a collar and this collar is resting against white metal bearings on the ahead direction as well as on the astern direction so the collar is in between we as engineers are required to maintain the minimum of the stipulated clearance between the collar and the white metal in the ahead direction it is in one direction actually because when you have the astern movement it will go back and the clearance will be the same in the opposite side of the collar so this clearance has to be within that stipulated level which can accommodate that marginal vibratory pressures now if the clearance was very large then the amount of impact loading on the two surfaces will become very large and the white metal will get damaged so one of the reasons for damage to thrust bearing is incorrect clearances at the thrust bearing that is one number one number two <clears throat> the main bearings are also likely to get damaged there also you have some amount of vibration which can cause damage so vibration causes a lot of damage within the engine machinery all machinery your job your responsibility will be to keep the vibrations to the minimum and ensure that the clearances are to the required level if you can do this you have a very smooth running ship for all its machines all right next what we have is machinery vibrations can be categorized into three types depending on the nature of the vibration all right so these three types are largely torsional vibration and everybody knows what is torsional vibration for rotating shafts if the shaft is vibrating intermittently without a continuous torque without a smooth uniform torque you will have torsional vibrations okay it is something like this suppose i have a shaft and i twist this and suppose there is a weight at the end fixed like that okay and this end is fixed so if i twist this and i let go what will happen this is going to vibrate like that okay this is going to vibrate to and fro to and fro to and fro and slowly come to a stop so at what frequency will it be vibrating it is will vibrate at a natural frequency which is inherent within the shaft system itself this frequency will change if the length is longer if the diameter is different if there is a fracture in it but this natural frequency is called its fingerprint not only for torsional vibration also for normal vibration if this is an iron rod and you hit it it will vibrate at a certain frequency that frequency is called its fingerprint its fingerprint its identity what is its identity its identity is that its natural frequency is 241 okay so 241 cycles per second is its normal vibrating frequency similarly for a torsional vibration you have a certain frequency all right remember this right now because after this i'm coming back to it with a, a reason for critical speed okay so that is torsional vibration axial vibration axial vibration is of course a longitudinal vibration so you will see i just now explained to you why there will be an axial vibration on the tail end shaft and the intermediate shaft arising out of pulses or pressure pulses from the propeller so that gives you your axial vibrations on the tail end shaft and the intermediate shaft 
Now for the crankshaft also, there is some amount of axial vibration. We come to that just now. Other than this, you have lateral vibration, transverse vibration, which is side to side vibration. Okay. So the full engine is capable of vibrating side to side. The main shaft is capable of vibrating side to side. So the entire engine moving to one side to the other is also a transverse or lateral sideways vibration. If you see in a diagram, this is the diagram which will explain to you what is axial vibration in the engine. And this axial vibration in the engine is actually arising because of the axial vibration of the shafting. The piston is not moving axially. Piston is moving vertically. Okay. There is some amount of vertical vibration also, but that is not so much of a relevance at the moment. So we will not get into the thick of it. Let us consider the vibrations which are most relevant to us and the engines as of now. So apart from this, you have transverse or sideways vibration. But in some cases, some engines, some books, some technical papers consider this as torsional vibration. I don't like to use this term torsional vibration for the engine. I would like to use the torsional vibration for the crankshaft or any shaft which has a rotary movement. So this rotary movement of the crankshaft is ultimately torsional vibration. This torsional vibration is got enormous implications, enormous implications. And I will tell you just now what implication. Remember axial vibration, torsional vibration and transverse or sideways vibration. These are the three vibrations that we need to deal about within this subject. If you have any questions, do not hesitate to type it out on the chat column. I will, and that is why I have kept the chat, chat column visible. So anyone has to say something, you definitely can type it out and put it in there. Okay. So these are the three vibrations that are involved with the engine. Now let us consider torsional vibration. Engines with six or more cylinders in a straight line configuration can have very flexible crankshaft due to their longer length longer the length more is the torsional vibration tendency because stiffer the crankshaft lesser is the tendency for torsional vibration so if it is a six cylinder engine definitely it will have a lot of vibration as compared to a four cylinder engine okay two stroke engines generally have these are normal principles on my neck These are normally principles how torsional vibration acts. So, I had some diagrams yesterday which I showed on the screen. You can go out. One minute. Where is the diagram? I'll have to put it on the screen. I will show some means where I could draw directly. Not here. Okay. Let's read it up and I will draw a diagram and I will show you right now. See the second point. Two stroke engines. This what is this? Two stroke engines generally have a smaller bearing overlap. What does it mean? Everybody knows overlap when it comes to the inlet and outlet valves of a four-stroke engine. Everybody knows what is valve overlap in engine. But now here you have a bearing overlap. What does it mean? Okay, I'll explain to you. Between the main bearing and the pin bearings due to the larger stroke length. Hence, increasing the flexibility of the crankshaft due to decreased stiffness. Okay, try to understand this. I will give it a better explanation. Once I draw it, it becomes very easy. What is bearing overlap? You see, if the stroke of the engine is very short, what will happen? The crank pin bearing axis and the crankshaft main journal axis will be very close to each other. But if the stroke is very long, 
then the distance between the crank pin and the main joinet will also become very large. So if you have a crankshaft which has got a long stroke, that means it's got a long stroke, it means that ability for that shaft to twist is much more. In other words, the shaft becomes much more flexible, a torsional vibration is concerned. So it is more likely to twist. But in a shaft which has a small crank throw, which means the axis of the crank pin and the axis of the main journal are very close to each other. Then the diameter of the crank pin and the diameter of the journal will overlap at their perimeter. So let's have a diagram. Black color. What is bearing overlap where crankshafts are concerned? Yeah, now have a look at this. I hope you can see this reasonably clearly. The one on the right side, what you see of you, or I don't know if it is coming as left side to you, left or right doesn't matter. So this one is the one that has got bearing overlap. You see the crank pin bearing is on top and the journal is at the bottom. <coughs> Where the two circles overlap each other, that is called the bearing overlap. Whereas in this case, in a two-stroke engine, where the crank throw is very large, you see the, connect, uh, the crank pin bearing axis over here and the main journal over here. <coughs> so the distance is very large. In this case, the crankshaft is very flexible. In this case, the crankshaft is very rigid. It is not easily going to twist because of the two distances. Have you understood? Ravi no, Pratash, have you understood? Okay, very good, very good. So this is called bearing overlap. I think I will put it as a small question in your party exam. What do you understand by bearing overlap in valves, the inlet and outlet valves of an engine and the bearing, lap, bearing overlap in a crankshaft? So that creates a new question for you. So you'll be able to answer and with a diagram and make sure you make the diagram something like this to indicate what is bearing overlap and in contrast to it, what is a flexible crankshaft. Okay, so why why it would be stiff? Can you re-explain? Now you, now you have to, <clears throat> okay, now I'll show you why it will be stiff. It will definitely be a lot stiffer than a crankshaft. Now consider these two crankshafts. One is here. We all know that a simple straight shaft is much more stiff as compared to a shaft which has got cranks on it because it can twist much more easily. Okay, now have a look at these two, two crank shafts. One is on top and one is at the bottom. Now if you twist from one end, which shaft do you think is more stiff and which shaft do you think is going to be more 
flexible in torsion so that is why the top one you see has got overlap with the crank pin and the main journal whereas the lower shaft it has got a lot of distance between the crank pin and the journal so that gives it some flexibility for the crank web to bend <clears throat> i shown shown you in my crank shaft explanation uh, why uh, the yeah i shown you in the earlier diagram when the force of the connecting rod is acting on the pin the crank web tends to bend all right and the longer the crank web is more it tends to bend so that is what makes it more flexible but if the crank web was short and the force was coming on the crank pin it is not going to bend so easily so that is what it makes it more stiff so you see the upper one is much more stiff as compared to the lower one so that is why the ones with the overlap are considered much more stiff as compared to the ones which has a long throw <clears throat> all right i hope you understand ravi stiffness is meant for restricted movement obviously that is true what is stiffness if you take a rubber shaft and you twist it it is not so stiff but if you take a wood it is definitely stiff but if you take a steel it is the stiffest amongst all three that is what is stiffness ability to create a torsion is or resistance to create a torsion is stiffness so here resistant to create torsion in the upper one is much more than the lower one so that is why it makes this one much more stiff as compared to the lower one okay there is inherently little damping in a crankshaft to reduce the vibration except for the shearing resistance of the oil in the main and con rod bearings okay now <clears throat> now i by now you should under, have understood what is torsional vibration i told you that ability for the shaft to twist is torsion and resistance to twist is resistance to torsion means more stiff it is stiffer it is less amount of torsional ability it will have okay now all material are elastic in nature and we are going to consider mainly steel because most of our components are made of steel now when the shaft is rotated it is capable of coming back by itself so it has a, a flexibility a elasticity and flexibility which allows some amount of torsional vibration now by itself there is some amount of damping effect that means after some time of torsional vibration it will stop okay additionally the lubricating oil which is holding the shaft in the bearing provides some resistance to vibration it is marginal why because the oil starts to getting sheared as a film between the shaft and the bearing so the shearing force which is involved during the vibration is a dampening effect on the vibration itself okay it is marginal but this is not really enough we need to have much better much more increased damping to any torsional vibration okay let's move on axial vibration we will come back to torsional vibration again but you, i hope you have understood what is torsional vibration if you have a rubber shaft and you put a weight across you twist it and you let go obviously the shaft is going to vibrate like that okay and then it will slowly come to a stop okay steel also behaves the same way it will also vibrate and then come to a stop in fact i will give you one example of how torsion is used for a shaft as a spring torsion can be used as a spring you see this is a little off the topic so pay attention some of you will have a fridge 
I thanking everybody of you. I've got a fridge at home. All right. Now, when you open the main door, up on top is the deep freeze. Okay, that deep freeze door. When you open and you let go, it goes and closes by itself. You go and find out how that spring is affecting, how that spring works, and there you will get the best example how torsional ability provides some amount of springiness. All right, that is a very very interesting lesson for you. Go to your fridge, open the deep freeze. I suppose most fridges will have this. Moment you open that door and you let go, the door closes by itself. How does it close? You will not find a coiled spring or anything like that. So find out how it works. It took me some time to find out, but I found out about ten years ago. So I was pretty impressed that this property of steel can be used as a spring without it forming a spring. Okay. So do do this experiment at home and find out for yourself. So that is about right. torsional vibration. Ah, uh, yes. uh you said about the throw distance na the what that in the throw or that it if it Thank increases throw. the overlapping decreases yeah. na correct so and in the two stroke engine the uh, overlapping is very minimal correct there so, is no overlapping there so, is no overlapping uh, in me in is it any people. how related related to what like if strokes are like two stroke would have this uh, no overlapping because of bigger throw yes yes it will be related and because why the... it should be high why it should be like a throw should be greater in two stroke and it should be less in four stroke and all less in four stroke because there is a likelihood of overlapping so the shaft is much stiffer shaft if you consider hard rubber and soft rubber so consider two rubber shafts okay now the soft rubber is capable of twisting much more as compared to the hard rubber okay that means the hard rubber is little more stiff as compared to the soft rubber so the soft rubber is representative of a crank shaft which has got a large crank throw and the hard rubber is representative of a crank shaft which has got overlap the shaft is much more stiff to twist whereas a shaft with a large crank throw is much more easy to twist i can't imagine why you don't able to understand because the crank throw is large it gives it a bigger potential for twisting i had explained to you when the force from the connecting rod acts on the crank pin there is some bending of the web and this bending is transmitted to all of them so that is why it is much more flexible it is much more uh, it has much more ability to twist and ability to twist more makes it a more torsional vibrating capacity or rather ability so it is going to twist much more the angle of twist will be much larger that is why we have torsional vibration dampers much more on two stroke engines than you have on four stroke engine on four stroke engines i have not seen any torsional vibration damper but on two stroke engines you must have because that damping is very necessary we will come to this again for torsional vibration ravi is it mandatory to have large angle of my goodness ravi prakash the why are long stroke engines so essential in today's world i have been trying to tell you the stroke is getting longer and longer to burn poor and poor grades of fuel so if the stroke becomes longer then the distance on the crank pin to the journal becomes longer and longer so you have much more of possibility of torsional vibration it's inevitable you are asking me is it mandatory to have large crank throw in two stroke engine of course it is mandatory if you are going to burn poorer grades of fuel you have to relate all this together 
if you have poorer grades of fuel you need longer strokes because the fuel is given a bigger chance to burn and if you have a longer stroke it means you are going to have a much more flexible uh, crankshaft which will have more of twist in it and more possibility of torsional vibration everything is linked to each other okay ravi got it okay okay so let us go on to the next part the repeated this now we are coming to axial bending axial vibration okay the repeated bending of the crank pin alternatively as the crankshaft rotates results in an in and out movement of the webs when such microscopic movements occur rapidly an axial vibration follows okay now go back to that diagram in your mind which i showed you about the crank about the connecting rod in forcing on the crank pin you see the crank pin bends not only the crank web twists it also bends it is bending not only in one direction it is bending in the secondary direction and that secondary direction is towards the crank pin so when you bend a crank pin between two webs if you bend push a force over here obviously the crank webs are going to bend in this direction all right this is microscopic in nature so each time there is a force on the crank pin the crank webs are going to bend inwards moment it bends inwards what happens the whole shaft is going to come together the moment bends inwards outward inwards outward inwards outward and alternatively it is not that all the crank pins are bending at the same time because the firing order is different the crank force is different so alternatively one bends again expand one bends again expand. this continuous in and out movement of the webs results in an axial vibration of the crank shaft so you have two modes of axial there is a third one first one is crank webs moving in out in out in out causes axial vibration of the crank shaft this crank shaft is attached to the intermediate shaft and this intermediate shaft also vibrates out of the thrust from the propeller being varying in nature that means there are pulses on the propeller which will cause some vibration of course most of this vibration is taken up within the thrust block but some of it will also be transmitted to the shaft okay this is one the third one is also there let's read it the first one is the repeated bending of the crank pins alternatively as the crank shaft rotate results in an in and out movement of the webs when such microscopic movements occur rapidly an axial vibration follows which we <clears throat> actually there is a longer explanation to it if i put in everything our whole powerpoint program will be based on that i have made it as brief as possible and remember the in and out movement ultimately results in an axial vibration otherwise the technical paper that explains axial vibration consists of 10 12 pages i cannot put all the information here the way next number 2 the varying pressure acting on the propeller blades cause fluctuating forces on the shafting so from the sh entire shaft which is attached to the connecting uh, to the crank shaft will also vibrate actually remember this vibration is in fraction of a millimeter maybe two thirds of a millimeter or 1 millimeter at the most not more displacement is not so much nevertheless there is vibration and nevertheless there is potential for damage to the bearings cause fluctuation in the shafting this to result in contributing to axial vibration the thrust block and pads bear some of these vibratory forces some of it there is always a layer of lube oil and lube oil with a certain temperature maintains a certain viscosity and this viscosity provides for the dampening of the impact loads that arise out of vibration the third one torsional vibration with accompanying shear stresses also contributes to axial vibration in shafts 
Okay, now how do I explain this? Now, think of it like this. <clears throat> think of a square section rubber rod. Square section rubber rod. The edge has a certain length, fixed length. Now, when you twist that rod, that straight length becomes a helix. All right? That straight edge of the rubber becomes a helix. And if the helix is to be same as the length, obviously the length has to become shorter. Okay? So that is why whenever there is torsional stress on a shaft, it has a tendency to shorten. This continuous torsional stress and relaxation of the stress causes a increased decrease of the length in micromillimeters. This also contributes to some amount of axial vibration. Continuously the shaft is moving actually longer and actually shorter. How to explain this? That's why I said consider a square section rubber, a certain length, one foot. Now twist it from the two ends. Hold it at one end and twist it. So the edge that you see will form a helix. And that helix, if it is to be the length of the rod, it will have to be shorter. So that is why when you have a piece of rope, ordinary rope, you twist it and you see it has become shorter. And you untwist it, it becomes longer. You twist it again. सर को बुलाओ बे कोई पांच मिनट का ब्रेक मिल गया भाई शांति से रुको अबे सर उधर बोले जा रहे होंगे बोले जा रहे होंगे तो बोल रहे हो जा रहे फिर फ्रिज खोल के देखेंगे
Sorry, boys. There was a bit of a network problem. Don't go away. We have changed the. I have two different networks from home, so there should be no problem. We'll go back. Okay. I hope uh, this. I think this this place was okay. Can you hear me now, Pratham? Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So, okay. Uh, there was a network problem and it collapsed. So I got it again uh, rechanged. So we were explaining axial vibrations. Remember, there are three conditions or three different sources where axial vibrations can be generated. One is the crankshaft itself on account of bending of the webs. Another one is from the propeller. And third one is twisting of the shaft itself causes some amount of axial movement. So these are the three sources for axial vibration. Next is vibration types, defects and damping. Now we are going into slowly into what the consequences of vibration are and thereafter we will go into uh, uh, how it is damped. Vibrations in diesel engines are most complex as magnitude and direction of the forces creating the vibration. Even not presenting. Not presenting it, sir. Oh, oh, oh. Just a minute. I'll do it again. Present now. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. Sorry. Okay. That should be better. That should be better. Okay. Okay. Now is it coming through? Now is it coming through? Hello. Yes, yes sir. sir. Okay. So I had told you in the first case that these are the three sources of actual vibrations. Just keep in mind that the subject matter, if it is dealt with in detail, we will go into 10 pages each on to explaining actual vibration. For our part, at the moment, we need to know what is the source of actual vibration. And the source of actual vibration is the crankshaft itself on account of the in and out bending. Second one is the thrust from the propeller. And the fourth one, twisting of a shaft tends to shorten and untwisting cause it to elongate. And the example you can give is take a short rope. If you twist that rope, you will see that rope has shortened marginally. And you untwist it, it becomes a little longer. So continuous torsional vibration, which causes a shift in the two faces of the ends of the shaft, will bring about shortening, lengthening of the shaft to give rise to vibrations, uh, actual vibration. Now, vibration, the diesel engine, this you know because I have explained to you what are the number of forces that create the vibration and they vary throughout one revolution. And for this, you need mathematical approach. Oh my God, who's come now? Somebody was left out. Okay. Shikij. <clears throat> the firing forces in a slow running engine create large, low frequency vibrations in contrast to the blades of a turbocharger, which have high frequency but low magnitude of vibration. Low magnitude and amplitude means the same here. Both these types can cause component failure. That means if you have a large amplitude of vibration, but the frequency is low, it can cause fatigue failure. And in another case where you have frequency is very high, but the amplitude is very small. That means very small vibration, but the frequency is very high. There also you can have a failure. In either case, vibration can cause fatigue failure. So the failure that results from the vibration almost universally fatigue failure. He has taken an example of a crankshaft or any component within the engine that is vibrating slowly. And he has considered a turbine rotor where the blades on the rotor are vibrating at a very high frequency. In fact, the sounds that you hear from a turbine are vibration of the turbine blades when the gas passes through it. You see, the gas which passes through or the steam which passes through, it continuously varies the pressure on the blade. 
this fluctuating pressure on the blade causes that vibration and this vibration comes as a very high pitched whine whine a very high pitched sound okay and any of these vibration actually results in fatigue failure it's inevitable okay the type of fatigue failure accounts this type of fatigue failure accounts for the greatest proportion of material failure in engine components this is most vibration that is why you as engineers i keep harping that you have to take care that pipelines machines etc do not vibrate too much moment they vibrate you think nothing is happening it is only vibrating but definitely after some time you find it has broken and then you look at it oh it is broken it is poor quality it is not poor quality it is something that should not happen one is a natural okay vibrations can be separated into one of two forms one is the natural frequency which is a function of the material itself and its resistance to movement if i push it it does not want to move if i push this it does not want to move but i make it move and then it comes back to its normal position all right now in it coming back to its position the tendency because it has some mass it it will tend to have back and forth movement this back and forth movement is translated as vibration uh now boys i can understand why boys come in the middle of the class possibly their internet connectivity was lost and they had to come in so anyway i will admit everybody no problem no question of delays in the middle one is the natural vibration which is a function of the material itself and its resistance to movement and the second one is the forced vibration it cannot vibrate unless there is some force implied implied to it that means if i force it then only it vibrate if i hit it then it vibrate otherwise by itself it is not going to vibrate so there has to be a forced condition a forcing frequency if it is one frequency it continues to vibrate and then it stops but if that forcing frequency is repeated it is repeated then this will continue to vibrate so that is why most engine components are continuously vibrating because the forcing frequency is continuously there okay now be very very understanding over this if i give it one time it vibrates and then it stops but if i give it continuously it will continue to vibrate and that is why most components in the engine room or machinery continuously vibrate now now there is one catch here if this forcing frequency becomes the same as the natural frequency then what happens then is a real problem but we'll come to that shortly one is natural frequency of vibration and one is forced vibration this is the result of the frequency with which the applied force occurs okay if i put it once there is no frequency really it is only one time force but if i keep striking it then i have a forcing frequency forcing frequency that means the frequency of applied force the example in an engine is a six cylinder engine rotating at 100 rpm will have a forcing frequency of uh what is i have made a mistake something i think 6 into 100 hertz but hertz is rpm or uh, per second ravi ravi prakash it is just per second per second per second second so the 100 has to be translated into 60 isn't it now it makes sense because 100 rpm should be translated as 100 into 60 revolutions per second i think this makes more sense anyway the point is for every rpm there will be some amount of vibration and that vibration translated will have a frequency of 6 because there are six cylinders okay 
so this is what is natural frequency and forced frequency answer the main problem arises when match answer would be 360 sorry in the previous slide answer would be different like 3600 yeah 6 into 36 okay ah uh, sorry sorry 3600 that makes me sense okay so that will be our frequency of one more zero sir 3000 100 rpm grade into 60 na there is one more zero okay 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 100 36 hertz 36000 hertz okay that makes more sense because hertz is in seconds cycles per second yes i remember it was cycles per second okay the main problem arises see vibration by itself it is of normal level it is not so much of a problem but it becomes a problem when the two frequencies become equal to each other that means the natural frequency and the forced frequency they come into phase all right they come into phase and then you have a condition of resonance resonance means amplified vibration amplified vibration of any component why does it happen now if one component has got a natural frequency of 200 and i hit it only at a frequency of 150 it is going to be no resonance but if i increase that 150 to 160 170 180 190 200 moment both are at 200 then the whole thing vibrates enormously this is called resonance if you see i have a graphical representation of what it means if you have a natural frequency which is in red natural frequency is in red and the forcing frequency is in black and this particular diagram has shown the forcing frequency and natural frequency in the same wavelength but the amplitudes are different amplitude of natural frequency and amplitude of forcing frequency is slightly different but the resulting frequency which is called resonant frequency become very large so this is the condition of resonant frequency the frequency that is shown with a high amplitude is resonant frequency this happens almost to a large number of items in the engine room how it happens i will tell you suppose you are in the engine room taking watch and suddenly you find one pipe suddenly vibrating very severely <laughs> you think there is a ghost in it some bhoot has come in the engine room and you see it's vibrating and after some time it stops again or again another pipe it may happen because the clamp is not there and the pipe starts vibrating and then it stops again out of nowhere how oh, you see the vibrating frequency from the engine is transmitted to the hull from the hull to the Uh, bulkheads and the bulkheads are also vibrating if at any point of time the bulkhead vibration and the pipe which is loose and held in the reasonably loose and held with that bulkhead both will start vibrating and it has happened to me number of times what we do we just go and put another clamp over there and we stop the vibration because if we allow that pipe to continuously vibrate that pipe will fracture either it will fracture on its own at the point where there is a anti node node is the point of minimum vibration and anti node is the point of maximum vibration so at the anti node it will fracture it will fracture there or it will fracture at the support because at the support the whole thing is vibrating and it is striking that support so the surface gets worn out and the pipe ruptures it has happened to me also that is why i want you to know on first hand you shouldn't have the mishap of a fuel pipe suddenly out of the blue whole oil leaking from that pipe why that pipe has been vibrating and we have not observed it sometimes that i told you small vibration with a sorry a very high vibration with a small amplitude or it could be a high amplitude with a small vibration both are damaging so pipelines also can fail machinery components can fail bearings can fail shafts can fail we have pump shafts also failing 
but I could not identify how that pump shaft of a large centrifugal pump, it simply got cut as if a knife has been cut through. You start the pump and you feel, oh, the motor is running, but there is no pressure. What has happened? The shaft from the motor to the pump has got sheared off. Fatigue failure. So when we dismantled the shaft, we saw the shaft from the end and we concluded it is fatigue failure. Okay. So let's go through with this before I show you the pictures. Oh, it's already 11.05. The forcing frequency acting at the same time and in the same direction tends to amplify the natural frequency substantially to such an extent that the strength of the material may no longer be able to withstand the stressing within the component. Ultimately, fatigue failure occurs with cracks passing through the material until insufficient area is left to carry the load and complete failure, which is called rupture, takes place. Now, this is the diagram which shows you how a shaft can fail. You see, let us see the bottom right hand side diagram. This is actually a diagram made out or a shaft which has failed under fatigue. You see, when a shaft is rotated, the maximum stress comes on the surface. All right. So the maximum twist takes place on the surface. So the shear is maximum at the surface. Now, if on the surface you have any flaw, any damage, any dent, any scratch, any hole, that will be the origin of the failure. So once it fails, the failure continues with the crack extending through its depth. And at each stage, you will find a mark. Now these marks are called beach marks. See, the sand on the beach, when the sea water keeps coming in, it makes marks in lines. These lines on a broken shaft are also called beach marks. And the area between those beach marks are called striations. S-T-R-I-A-T-I-O-N-S. You can write it down with a pencil. We are going to finish the class this now. And as these cracks keep extending within the shaft, there comes the time when the shaft cannot take the torsional load and the full shaft breaks suddenly. So this, uh, all this scrawly part of the shaft is shining and you can see it is a rough surface and it is indicative of sudden rupture. The shaft has broken suddenly. The old part of the breakage is in these cracks over here. So this is can be seen on the picture on the left hand side. You see on the surface, there has been a damage to this shaft over here and that crack has extended to a point where you see these striations or these beach marks. And then suddenly the whole shaft has broken at one shot. The surface itself may not be the cause of the origin of the fracture. It can be, you see the second diagram on the left side, the failure has started from within the shaft. So there was a flaw inside the shaft, maybe an impurity, maybe a small fracture, maybe a dislocation of the crystalline structure and the fracture has started circumferentially around that point. And it has kept breaking, kept breaking, kept breaking gradually till it has reached a point where there was not enough surface area to take the load and the whole shaft has broken suddenly as a rupture. So these two diagrams on the left top show failure with one having the origin of failure at the surface and the other one within the material itself. I think we call it a day today because we are ready for your next class. So there, is one other two... there is one question, sir, from Karthik. Yeah, okay. Uh, sir, what would be our immediate action if any fatigue failure is there? See, in most cases, fatigue failures are failures. You can't do anything. Uh, that is, it is broken. You have to replace it. And you have to do root cause analysis. Root cause analysis means identify the cause. Why has it taken place? Was there a flaw? Now, in this right-hand side, what you see is a flaw within the shaft. It's something you cannot take care of much. You cannot do much. There's a fault within the machine. In the other cases, you see the shaft like this. When a crank pin is checked, you have to check the smoothness of the surface. 
that is why you need a mirror finish you understand what is a mirror finish because the surface has to be absolutely perfect because the maximum stress arises from there that is one number two you have to minimize torsional vibration from occurring and that is why you need to have torsional vibration damper i wish we had little more time we could have done torsional vibration dampers here now here is an actual vibration damper and uh, much later we will have a this is your torsional vibration oh i think we need one more class we need one more class as of now we have come up to this point and the means is root cause analysis find the cause of having this fatigue failure definitely there will be a cause either there is misalignment or there is unbalancing or there is some extra cause for vibration or there is a flaw within the machine component or there is a damage which has not been noticed by somebody which has been the origin of such a failure so fatigue failure is also a responsibility of the engineer it is not oh because it is fatigue so it has failed no fatigue failure is also the responsibility of an engineer and he must do some amount of root analysis to identify the real reason because a crankshaft or a normal shaft will not fail normally they have been x-rayed they have been radio what radio frequency tested and when they were installed they were very good they were not bad but the badness has come about during operation so the fault lies within the engineers who are operating the machine all right till today we have done 26 remember this plate number 26 and next class we will discuss critical speed of an engine this is also a very interesting part so as of now we call it a day to day okay okay immediate cause kartik keshari root cause analysis you have to find out the reason for the failure and take every measure for it not to happen okay bye bye thank you sir okay